Hi and welcome to Winifred Conkling's Sylvia and Aki. I'm going to be reading chapters one and two today. A note about word choice. Today we use the terms Mexican American and Japanese American when referring to United States citizens of Mexican and Japanese descent. In the 1940s, however, these people were commonly called Mexicans and Japanese, regardless of citizenship. The term Mexican was also used to describe people from all Spanish-speaking countries, not just those from Mexico. In keeping with the language usage of the time, this book uses the words Mexican and Japanese, although the author recognizes that many of the people involved were U.S. citizens. Sylvia calls her parents mom and dad, and Aki referred to mom and pop. They use these classic American names rather than mommy and papi, or okasan and otusan, in an attempt to assimilate or blend into American culture. Last, in the city of Westminster, California, where much of this story takes place, Westminster Main School was also known as the 17th Street School. Sylvia and Aki remember it as Westminster School, and that is how it is referred to in this book. Part 1, California and Arizona, 1941. Chapter 1. He who doesn't look ahead remains behind. Mexican proverb. Sylvia, Westminster, California. Sylvia Mendez imagined her first day of third grade at Westminster School. She would use her freshly sharpened yellow pencils to write her name in cursive at the top of her worksheets. Her just out of the shoebox black Mary Janes would glide across the polished linoleum of the hallway. At the end of the day, she would come home and her father would hug her and ask, what did you learn today? Then she would tell him about the teacher and her classmates and everything else. Sylvia never imagined the one thing that actually happened even before her first day of school. She was turned away. Summer vacation was nearly over. It was the morning Sylvia was to register for school. She rode with her Aunt Soledad to her two brothers and her cousins in the back seat of her family's blue Pontiac sedan, watching orange groves and fields of lima beans, sugar beets, and asparagus rush by. The flat Southern California landscape stretched to the mountains, one farm after another, each a distinct pattern of green stripes. We have a farm, Sylvia thought, for the first time, our very own farm. Sylvia's father had worked as a field hand on other people's farms most of his life. But now things were different. Now her father was the boss. That day her parents had stayed at home because the irrigation system on the farm needed fixing. She knew it wouldn't last forever. Sylvia's family had leased the asparagus farm from a Japanese family who would someday return. The school's right up here, Aunt Soledad announced, jolting Sylvia back into the present. They had entered downtown Westminster. A dozen or so small businesses clustered among a couple of main streets. No churches, no movie theaters, no department stores. It was utterly different from busy Santa Ana where Sylvia had lived before. The car turned on 17th Street and they passed a large cream colored stucco building with fancy arches over the doorways and pretty flower beds in front. The word auditorium was spelled out along the side. She imagined going to assemblies or watching the older kids play sports. Wow, Sylvia thought. Her aunt slowed the car and pulled into the parking lot. Is that it? Sylvia whispered to her cousin Virginia. That's our new school? I guess so, Virginia whispered back. Sylvia had never seen a school like it. Cypress trees and other evergreens surrounded the buildings like tall guards, reminding her of a park and making the place look important. Look, Sylvia cried, pointing at the playground. Real monkey bars. Her old school in Santa Ana didn't have any playground equipment, not even a rope swing on a tree limb. She pictured herself climbing up the ladder and swinging from rung to rung, her legs dangling free beneath her. I'm going to go all the way across without dropping, said Sylvia's younger brother, Jerome. I'm going to go all the way across and back again, boasted her other younger brother, Gonzalo Jr. Come on, Aunt Soledad urged. There will be time for that later. Sylvia and the boys followed Aunt Soledad and their two cousins into the front office. Inside, the school secretary sat behind her desk, pecking away at a typewriter. Sylvia watched, fascinated, as the woman's long, pale fingers tap-danced over the typewriter keys, clickety-clacking out words with a steady beat. 
A fan perched on a table across the room swept back and forth, stirring the woman's light brown hair with every pass. She continued typing without even glancing at the newcomers. How may I help you? I'm Soledad Vidari, said Sol S Sylvia's aunt, bah, and I would like to register these children for school. The secretary fished the enrollment papers out of a desk drawer and handed them to Aunt Soledad. She went back to her typing. While Aunt Soledad filled out the forms, Sylvia peered out the office door and down the long hallway, its polished floor shining like the surface of a still pond. Across the hall, there was a table with a big stack of brand new textbooks. Sylvia stepped out, picked one up, and read the title, Down the Road. It had a bright yellow cover showing a mother duck followed by five little ducklings. Sylvia had never held a new textbook before. She closed her eyes and imagined gently opening a book for the very first time, smelling the newness, running her palm over each smooth page, turning the crisp corners with the tips of her fingers. What would it be like to be the first one to read that book? A book that wasn't worn and soiled by countless other fingers. Reluctantly, she sat down the textbook and returned to the office just as Aunt Soledad completed the first set of papers. Excuse me, ma'am, Aunt Soledad said to the secretary. May I have several more forms for my brother's children? The woman stopped typing again. She looked at Sylvia and her brothers as if noticing them for the first time. Are these your children? No, Aunt Soledad said. These two are mine. She rested one hand on Alice's shoulder and the other on Virginia's. They'll be entering third and fourth grade. Sylvia looked at her cousins. They had fair skin and wore their long wavy brown hair in tight curls tied back from their faces with navy ribbons. These are my brother's children, Aunt Soledad said, gesturing at Sylvia and her brothers, all three alike with warm brown skin, dark hair, and dark eyes. Jerome and Gonzalo had broad, friendly smiles and neatly combed hair. Sylvia, Sylvia wore her hair in two straight braids with a red bow pinned above her right ear. She tried to smile too, but something in the way the woman was looking at them made her uneasy. What are their names? The secretary asked with a sigh. Mendez, Sylvia, Gonzalo Jr., and Jerome. The woman held up a hand to interrupt Sylvia's aunt. The Mendez children will need to register at Hoover School, the Mexican school. What? No, Aunt Soledad objected. I want all of the children in the same school. Both families live in Westminster. Mexican children go to the Mexican school, the woman insisted. But we live here, Aunt Soledad repeated, all of us together. Sylvia and her family lived in the main house on the farm, while Aunt Soledad and her family lived in one of the smaller caretaker houses. I'm sorry, but there's nothing I can do about the rules, the woman said, noisily shutting the desk drawer. No, you see, the children are cousins, Aunt Soledad tried again. Her voice remained calm, though Sylvia could see an angry tightening at the corners of her mouth. The Mendez children will go to the Mexican school. But I can't do anything about it, the secretary said impatiently. Do you want to register your two or not? Sylvia watched her aunt. Will she listen to the secretary and send us to a different school? Aunt Soledad drew in a deep breath, but then she paused and let her breath escape with a sigh. No, Aunt Soledad said firmly. No, I do not want to register my girls. Sylvia had expected her aunt to let out a furious rush of angry words, but now she realized that those few words were just enough. Aunt Soledad had nothing more to say. She simply turned around and marched through the open doorway. Sylvia and the other children followed behind her in a single file. We're like the ducklings on the cover of those brand new textbooks, Sylvia realized. The ones that I won't ever get a chance to read. On the way home, Aunt Soledad didn't speak. She clutched the steering wheel fiercely and glared at the road. Virginia and Gonzalo rode in the front seat, and Sylvia was squeezed between Jerome and Alice in the back, their forearms touching. Sylvia looked down at their hands, her skin the color of dark caramel, and then she looked at Alice's hands, which reminded her more of dulce de leche, milk candy, lighter, creamier, paler than her own. Is this why they would take Alice and Virginia but not me, she wondered. Is it because my skin is too brown? Is this why me and my brothers were told to go to the Mexican school? But I'm not even Mexican, I'm American. What is my father gonna say about this? Sylvia gazed out the window. It was so unfair to everyone. Her mother was an American citizen from Puerto Rico. Her father had come from Mexico as a little boy, but he had become a United States citizen and worked hard all his life. 
How many times had her father told her that he wanted her to get the best education possible, to be the first in the family to finish high school, to go to college? She could hear his voice. I want you to have every opportunity I never had. Her father would be so disappointed if she didn't go to the Westminster School. Maybe Hoover School will be just as good as Westminster School. Maybe going to Westminster School doesn't really matter. Maybe my father won't be disappointed. But she couldn't help thinking about the monkey bars and the new textbooks and her heart sank. She guessed there would be no monkey bars and no textbooks at Hoover School. It would be like her old school in Santa Ana. Second hand, second best. We're being treated like second best people, she thought bitterly. A few minutes later, they turned off the main road and onto the long driveway with asparagus fields on either side. The farm buildings consisted of the main house, a bunkhouse, and three other smaller houses behind it, and a large barn with an open packing house beside it. Aunt Soledad made a dramatic entrance. She braked hard and fast, bringing the Pontiac to a sudden stop. She yanked the key out of the ignition, slammed the car door, and stormed off toward the packing house. Gonzalo, she called to her brother, Gonzalo. Sylvia and the others trailed Aunt Soledad. The afternoon sun fell in dusty streaks, highlighting crates of freshly picked asparagus. The air smelled of rich, wet soil. A couple of brown and white hens wandered past, pecking at the ground in sudden jerks. Sylvia's father looked up from his conversation with several packers. What's the matter, he asked his sister. The kids, they can't go to that school, Aunt Soledad said in a rush. The secretary said that the kids have to go to Hoover School because they're Mexican. Aunt Soledad didn't mention right away that Alice and Virginia could have enrolled at Westminster. Maybe she's trying not to embarrass our family, Sylvia thought. That can't be right, he said. Westminster's the closest school. I know, Aunt Soledad said, but they're supposed to go to that school for Mexican children. To Sylvia's surprise, her father didn't seem upset. He seemed, he smiled, and rested his hand on Aunt Soledad's shoulder. Don't worry, there must be a mistake. I'll take care of it tomorrow. Sylvia relaxed. She had every faith that her father would be able to set things right. Later that afternoon, Sylvia went to her room to put away the navy jumper and new school shoes her mother had bought her. Sylvia, her mother pushed open the bedroom door with a dish towel in one hand, taking a break from fixing dinner for the farm workers. Your father told me what happened when you went to register for school. She studied Sylvia's face carefully. Yeah, Aunt Soledad was pretty angry, said Sylvia. I am too. Mom, Sylvia began, do you think we'll be able to go to the Westminster School? I don't see why not. Sylvia's mother answered, that's the closest school. But the lady at the school said we have to go to a separate school for Mexicans next to the barrio. So, said her mother, we don't live in the barrio. I know. Your father will handle it. The oven timer sounded in the kitchen. The cornbread is ready, Sylvia's mother said. Do you want your door open or closed? Open's fine. Don't worry so much, it will all work out. You'll see. Then her mother left. Sylvia turned back to her closet. She picked up the box her new shoes had come in and pushed it onto the high shelf in her closet. Instead of sliding in completely, the box stopped three quarters of the way back. She shoved harder, but it was blocked by something at the back of the shelf, something she couldn't see. Sylvia dragged the ladder back chair from the desk over to the clo closet and climbed onto it. She reached up and moved the shoebox aside and stretched out her hand, running it back and forth over the shelf. She felt something, but accidentally nudged it just beyond her grasp. She stood on her tiptoes and stretched again. This time, she was able to grab the corner of a poster or paper of some kind. She dragged the paper and whatever was resting on top of it to the edge of the shelf. A sprinkling of dust showered down on her. Ugh, Sylvia cried, wiping her face with her arm. She reached up again and pulled down her treasure, a delicate Japanese doll and a photograph. Sylvia stepped down and set the photograph on her bed. She took the dust from the doll and blew it away as well as she could. The doll had black hair, blunt cut at the shoulders with straight bangs across her forehead. She wore a shimmering red satin robe made of a fabric as nice as that in her mother's best dress. Why would someone leave a doll like this behind? Sylvia wondered. Did someone forget it? Did someone leave it here for me to play with? Your name is Kiko, Sylvia told the doll. She didn't have any Japanese friends, but she had heard the name before. Sylvia placed Kiko on her pillow next to the Mexican doll her mother had given her. Carmencita wore a three-tiered skirt made of pink, turquoise, and purple cotton edged with zigzag trim in green and yellow. Carmencita, meet Kiko, Sylvia said. Kiko, this is Carmencita. She leaned the two dolls against her pillow. Then Sylvia reached for the black and white photograph. 
Three rows of children and a young woman, surely their teacher, smiled at the camera. Two girls in the front row held a sign. Westminster School, third grade, Mrs. Howard, 1941 to 1942. Turning the photograph over, Sylvia read the name. Aki Munen Mitsu, written on the back in shaky cursive. Sylvia peered more closely at the photograph and spotted a girl with almond eyes in the second row. Right away, she guessed this was Aki's photograph. This was Aki's bedroom. So Kiko must have been Aki's doll before she had to go away. Sylvia knew the Japanese family had been sent away because of the war, which was how her family had been able to lease the farm. After the United States had entered the war against Japan and Germany, all the Japanese along the coast of California had to leave their homes and move to inland camps until the war was over. How sad for them, Sylvia thought, but how lucky for us that we get to live here even for a little while. Sylvia put the photograph down and looked out the bedroom window at row after row of lacy asparagus plants. The late afternoon sun hung low in the sky, painting gold on everything it touched. The farm looked so pretty at that moment. Still, Sylvia could not let go of two important questions. Where is Aki now? And if a Japanese girl like Aki was allowed to go to Westminster School, why can't I? Chapter two, fall seven times, stand up eight, Japanese proverb. Aki, Westminster, California, eight months earlier. Aki expected to finish third grade at Westminster School. She planned to complete her book report on Call It Courage by Armstrong Sperry and present her oral report. She imagined she would attend the end of the year picnic and jump rope with the other girls in Mrs. Howard's class. And she thought that when she came home on the last day of third grade, her father would say, happy summer and take her out for ice cream. Aki never expected the one thing that actually happened. She was forced to leave behind her home, her school, her father, her whole life. The trouble started on a Sunday afternoon. It was December 7th, 1941. Aki sat at the dining room table with her math homework spread out before her. It was problems in long division two-digit divisors into four-digit dividends with re remainders. From time to time, Aki repeated her mother's instructions, sorry, her teacher's instructions, find the quotient, check your work. In the kitchen, her mother cleaned up the lunch dishes while the radio played a piano sonata. Aki's head was filled with numbers and music, and then the music stopped. We interrupt this program to bring you a special news bulletin, said a man's deep, serious voice. The Japanese have attacked Pearl Harbor, Hawaii by air. Aki laid down her pencil and joined her mother, who was standing by the sink with her right hand over her mouth. They both stared at the radio, listening closely to every word. Together they learned that at 7.53 a.m. Hawaii time, Japanese airplanes had bombed the United States Naval Station at Pearl Harbor. No one knew how many Americans were dead or how many ships had been destroyed. When the report ended, Aki asked, What does this mean? War, her mother said. It means there will be war. The word war and her mother's worried tone made Aki's stomach tighten. But why should we be worried, she asked herself. Hawaii is far from California. What does a war being fought in places I've never heard of have to do with us? When Aki's father and older brother came in from the fields, they received the news in bewildered silence. Aki wondered, since both of her parents had been born in Japan, if they were ashamed of what their home country had done. And were they afraid of what their new country, the United States, was going to do? Overnight, Aki's world changed. She watched neighbors turn against their neighbors. People refused to shop in Japanese-owned stores or hire Japanese employees. Whispers and suspicious looks from others often followed her and her family on their visits into town. She heard strangers mutter under their breath as they passed by, go back to where you came from. Aki and her family suddenly had the face of the enemy. They were loyal Americans, but many people assumed that anyone of Japanese ancestry would support Japan rather than the United States in the war. Community-wide blackouts were enforced. Anxious families turned off their lights or hung blankets in front of their windows so that their homes wouldn't be easy targets for nighttime bombers should the enemy ever make its way to California. Aki sometimes felt she lived in darkness, hiding any light, listening for the roar of enemy planes or the boom, boom, boom of falling bombs. Night 
brought the war close. And it was too easy in the dark to imagine neighbors agreeing that it was people like the Munamitsus who had brought things to this terrible point. A few days after President Roosevelt declared war on Japan, Aki saw a man standing in the street in Westminster with a sign, I am Chinese, not Japanese. For the first time in her life, Aki wondered if there was something wrong with being Japanese. And if that were true, then there was something wrong with her. She began to think of being Japanese as not merely different, but bad. A few months later, Aki and her mother went into downtown Westminster to shop for groceries. They noticed that posters had been placed on storefront windows and bulletin boards all over town. They read the one posted at the entrance to the library. It began, instructions to all persons of Japanese ancestry, and went on to declare that everyone with Japanese ancestors, even people who had only a single great-great-grandparent who was Japanese, had to register with a civil control station for evacuation. What is evacuation? Aki asked her mother. It means leaving, moving someplace else. Where? I don't know. Her mother's voice sounded flat and tired. Do we have to go? Yes, this says we all have to go. How long will we be gone? I don't know, her mother repeated. A few days later, Aki's father went to Santa Ana to register the family with the government. When he returned, he sank into an oversized chair in the living room. Come here, he said, patting his lap. Sit with me. Aki stepped toward him, but she stopped short of sitting. When she was younger, Aki used to climb her father like a mountain, scaling his legs and exploring the forest of whiskers on his cheeks. But that was a long time ago. Doesn't he understand that I'm no longer a child? He reached out for her, but Aki didn't take his hands. I'm not a baby, she said. Of course not, her father replied with a small smile. You're right. Now, there is much to do. Her father explained that they had only a few days to sell or secure all of their belongings. Each family member was allowed to pack a single suitcase or box with sheets, towels, dishes, and a limited amount of clothing. That's all, Aki's father said. We can only bring what we can carry. There was no time to waste. Later that afternoon, Aki's father and her brother went to the First Western Bank in Garden Grove for a meeting with Mr. Monroe, the banker, about the farm. Aki wanted to go with her father, but she knew it was Seiko who helped to translate between English and Japanese when her father conducted business. Aki found her mother sitting alone in the dining room table. She didn't smile when Aki came into the room. No one smiled very much anymore. Without speaking, Aki sat across from her mother. The table was stacked with many of their family's most prized possessions. While Aki watched, her mother picked up a small white ceramic bowl decorated with hand-painted red poppies. This belonged to your grandmother and my mother back in Japan, Aki's mother whispered. Aki watched her throat dry as her mother carefully wrapped the bowl in brown paper and nestled it in the little wooden chest in front of her. I carried it in this chest when I came here. Aki's mother reached for a rectangular tray of black lacquer with a delicate painting of a bird and a signature in Japanese characters in one corner. She tried to fit it into the wooden box, but it was too big. She sighed and said, this one is not so important. It's not from our family. She set it aside. What are you going to do with it? Aki asked. We must pack up or get rid of everything from Japan, her mother said. If we keep too many things from Japan, people may think we love Japan more than we love the United States. But that's not true, Aki protested. There is so much mistrust, so much anger everywhere. I couldn't bear to think of these things in the hands of people who would find them ugly and hateful. Aki's mother shook her head sadly. We can put some things in the attic, but we cannot be sure they will be there when we return. The war will be over someday, Aki thought, but so many of our beautiful things may be gone forever. Aki kept this thought to herself. In a world where so little made sense to her anymore, Aki would simply trust her mother and father and their decisions. Aki watched her mother pack, hoping that just sitting there, quietly being with her, helped her mother feel less alone. And that was all Aki could do. When the table was cleared and the non-Japanese dishes and serving pieces were returned to the china cabinet, Aki's mother said, we have more to do. She went to the hall closet and pulled from a shelf an old shoebox filled with family photographs. Aki recognized the envelope of photos that her father had carried with him when he moved from Kochiken, Japan to the United States in 1915. She knew he had come to America alone when he was just 16 years old. 
He had been eager to work on a farm when the land was plentiful and more fertile than in his ancestral home on the Japanese island of Shikoku, the smallest of the four main islands that made up the Japanese homeland. Aki's mother also came from Kochiken, but she had come to the United States later. Her mother opened a box and picked up a photograph of a young man wearing a wide-brimmed straw hat and standing in an asparagus field. This was your father not long after we married, Aki's mother said, holding the photograph so that Aki could see it. Aki recalled the story of how her father returned to Japan to find a wife. After her parents married, they moved to Southern California and worked as farmers. He had always been such a hard-working man, Aki's mother said. Then she set the photograph aside. Aki's mother reached for another photograph. Her fingers trembled when she picked up an image of a young woman holding an infant. Aki loved this picture of her mother, so young and proud and hopeful. Your brother was such a lovely baby, Aki's mother whispered. Aki looked at her mother and then at the picture, and she too forgot for a moment what they were doing and felt her mother's affection for them all. Tell me again the story of Seiko's name, Aki asked gently. We have a lot of work to do, her mother said briskly, but she could not stop herself from remembering. She started the story the way she always did. Your brother was born on February 13th, 1922, and you didn't know what to name him, Aki eagerly volunteered. She felt the two were like actors going over the familiar lines of a deeply loved script. That's right, her mother said. You went into labor on President Lincoln's birthday, Aki said. Yes, the pain started on February 12th and your brother was born on the following morning, Aki's mother said. Your father and I wanted to honor our Japanese heritage, but we also knew that we were Americans now. So we named our baby Seiko Lincoln. Seiko for your grandfather and our Japanese ancestry, and Lincoln in honor of the 16th president of the United States. It's a good thing he wasn't born on the 14th, Aki said, sitting up the punchline. That's right, or we might have named him Seiko Valentine. They laughed, and Aki felt a little better. The story belonged to her family. It was part of her that could not be taken away. It felt good knowing that it would remain safe in their hearts, not left behind like old photographs or pottery. Aki's mother sent Seiko's baby picture aside. One by one, Aki and her mother looked at dozens of pictures. Then Aki's mother gathered a small pile of photographs, which she tucked into an envelope and slipped into the wooden chest. Aki studied each of the remaining photos, trying to memorize the images before they were lost. When she finished, she handed the photographs back to her mother, who tore each one in half and then dropped the pieces into a waste basket. As the time drew closer for them to leave, Aki thought more and more about the unfairness of having to leave behind her farm, her school, and her friends. She recalled her mother's response. The first time she'd asked, why do we have to be evacuated? It's complicated, her mother had explained. Some people believe that people from Japan are a threat to our national security. How am I a threat to national security? Aki had asked. You're not, her mother had assured her, but the government doesn't know that. We'll just co cooperate so that we can come home as soon as possible. As Aki helped her mother pack, the wrongness of it all swept over her. Do we have to sell everything we don't take with us? Aki asked. She had seen other Japanese families selling their cars, refrigerators, bicycles, and other valuables on the side of the road. No, no, we're lucky. Mr. Monroe will help us. Aki knew that her parents trusted Mr. Monroe, the banker who had helped them to buy the farm. Her father wasn't allowed to buy land because he had never become an American citizen, but Mr. Monroe had found a way around this. Aki's brother had been born in the United States and was a citizen, so Mr. Monroe made Seiko the legal owner of the farm. Aki looked out her bedroom window at row after row of asparagus plants. Will we have to give up the farm, she asked. I don't think so, her mother said. Mr. Monroe will find someone who can take care of it while we're gone. Aki looked around her bedroom. What about my room, my things? You can take the, uh, what we can fit in the suitcase. Aki's suitcase suddenly seemed very small. One suitcase is not enough, she thought hopelessly. Her mother began packing sheets, towels, clothing, and toiletries. My entire world cannot fit into one tiny suitcase, cried the voice in Aki's mind. She grabbed the rag doll her mother had made her and tucked it into her suitcase between her nightgown and a sweater. Her mother closed the suitcase, reached into her apron pocket, and pulled out a manila cardstock tag with a long string. On the card, someone had written the family name, Munamitsu, and the word Postan. The card was stamped with five red numbers, 
13527. She tied one tag to the bag and placed a duplicate on the top of Aki's dresser. One tag stays on the luggage, Aki's mother said, and one is for you to keep. Aki looked around her room at the clothes and toys that did not fit in the suitcase. Someday all of these things can be replaced, her mother said, following her gaze. Then she stopped and corrected herself. Most of these things can be replaced. On the bed next to the suitcase, Aki had placed her favorite doll, a dancer with a porcelain face and red painted lips, the one with a red silk kimono and real hair cut into bangs. Her father had given her the doll when she was a tiny baby. It was the only thing she had that came from him alone. Without her mother saying anything, Aki knew that she could not keep the doll. It was Japanese. Bad. We will try to find another one when the time is right, her mother said. She picked up the doll and started to leave. Aki knew the doll was headed for the wastebasket. Aki had done her best to be strong for her mother, but she couldn't stop her eyes from filling with tears. She tried to distract herself by counting the numbers on wooden boards across the floor. One, two, three... I'm so, so sorry, her mother whispered, handling her, her daughter, the doll. Put it where it will be safe. Aki took the little dancer, then slipped her arms around her mother's waist. They clung to each other for a long time. When Aki finally eased her grip, her mother watched while Aki dragged a chair over to the closet and stretched in order to place the doll at the back of the top shelf, where it was hidden from view. Somewhere on that shelf, she had already placed her class photo from Westminster School. Hers was only one small face in a crowd of classmates. Surely it wouldn't offend anyone who might find it. Aki hoped that her hidden treasures, the doll and the photograph, both part of a happier time, would be waiting for her whenever she came back.